Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Our guest today is Travis Puglisi. Travis is the founder of Wandering Mojave Hiking Services. Wandering Mojave offers guided hiking and backpacking experiences in Joshua Tree National Park. Travis is a 20-year desert resident, and he is eager to share his stories and knowledge with you about his passion, the Joshua Tree National Park. Travis, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Thanks for having me, Howard. For our listeners, many of you know that I moved recently, or last July, from Chicago, Illinois to Las Vegas, Nevada. And I have been passionate about getting out to the desert, whether it's Lake Mead here in Nevada, Red Rock Canyon. But I've had this special interest of getting out to the Mojave Desert. And I have really almost every week gone out and traveled to the Mojave National Preserve. And as I began to explore, I discovered on other social media sites and through YouTube videos, Wandering Mojave Hiking Services. And this is how I discovered Travis was on Facebook. And Travis, this idea that you've grown up in the desert and you have this wonderful national park, Joshua Tree, which I have heard of for many years and have said, I want to be there. I want to visit. And here you are. It's like your desert playground. How about that? Yeah, it, it really is. You know, I can walk outside on door of my home and within about three quarters of a mile to a mile, I will be in federal national park land. And it's a blessing and it's definitely a privilege. Fantastic. Now, before we kind of dive into Wandering Mojave Hiking Services, would you share a little bit about your background? Because I'm curious how you reached this point where now you're providing this guided hiking and backpacking experiences. So tell us a little little bit about your background. Strangely enough, I ended up in the Mojave Desert by way of Rome, Italy. I'm a Navy brat, and I graduated high school on a Navy base in Sicily. Went to university in Rome for a year and a half, and then I dropped out. And I didn't have any money or skills, so I moved in with mom again. And mom just happened to be at 29 Palms Marine Base in 29 Palms, California. So I was really, you said grow, I grew up in the desert, and, and that's true. I didn't grow up here from, you know, adolescence or a young age, but I did kind of become an adult here. And so I started rock climbing in 2002, started working at a lot of ro- local restaurants where a lot of other rock climbers worked. That was really the beginning of my exposure to Joshua Tree National Park. I've lived all over the world. I've traveled all over the world. I spent 27 months working on the Antarctic continent. Being a traveler in wide open space is kind of something that's part of my nature, I suppose. Fantastic. Now, have you always had your profession where you're you're making a living? And I don't want to say job, J-O-B. We all have different kinds of jobs. But when you left the Navy, what type of work were you doing? And was it outdoors or was was it more mainstream types of opportunities? Sure. Well, once I finally kind of moved out on my own and got my first truck and got a place to stay, you know, I I worked at a restaurant and in the trades for a while. And that working in the trades is what brought me to Antarctica. And then when I finished that whole cycle on the ice down there, I came back to the high desert and I started throwing parties and working at events. Uh, And that was all fairly informal back then, but it's what I basically grew into my career. So for over a decade, I was working in the event production industry, as was my wife. And I was working steadily in that industry right up until March of 2020, at which point COVID destroyed that entire industry. And I had just happened to have created Wandering Mojave in January of 2020. So I immediately had something to fall back on. It was originally intended as a side gig, and, and then it became my, my profession. 
you know, that that's very interesting. And I know when you and I first chatted on the phone and, and I introduced myself to you and I recall uh, thinking, I wonder if this was a side hustle because we have a special on, on the show called Side Hustle Saturday where somebody has the full-time J-O-B and then kind of the work like you're doing with Wandering Mojave was going to be the side hustle. But lo and behold, you know, I think COVID upended a lot of people's lives. And, you know, for me, being here in, in the Las Vegas area, I've always loved the stars. And to be able to go out to the dark sky in Mojave and just kind of sit there or take pictures of the stars is just for me, I can't think of any place I would rather be if I have to be in quarantine or socially distanced from anybody. It's a blessing, so to speak. Yeah, I call that rural privilege, you know, and <laughs> a lot of a lot of people were suffering in, in urban areas and people are definitely still suffering. But being that I live in an exceptionally rural area with very low population density, it's been quite a different story out here in the Morongo Basin. Sure. Now, you mentioned that you had, you know, kicked off the business at the early part of 2020. So what prompted you to begin down that path to start Wandering Mojave? Well, it certainly was not because I was in the outdoor industry. At the time that I started that business, I was 38 years old. And it's not necessarily common for people of that age to move into the outdoor industry. But, you know, having lived out here for 20 years and hiking rather voraciously in the last decade, particularly through the areas specific to where my home is, I just developed an intensely intimate relationship with the landscape. And it wasn't really through following trails, strangely enough or at least not human trails. I spent a lot of time on animal trails and connecting very disparate parts of Joshua Tree National Park through these unusual avenues. And it wasn't until I created the company that I started doing trails more. But all that time that I spent more in the backcountry has really informed the product that I provide. It was just a natural move. I, I called it a passion profit project because it was something that I, I love so much. And it still feels that way, fortunately. When you were exploring in, in in the years prior to starting the business, uh, do you would you consider yourself a very I don't know if there's levels of experience or levels of confidence of being able to go out for a day, two, three, four days by yourself with just your belongings, perhaps traveling up to a trailhead, parking the car, and just heading out. How comfortable are you, or what What did it take, I should say, to get a level of comfort for yourself? I mean, maybe you took your family out, you know, your wife or your, your, your child, you have a young son. What, what did it take to develop that level of comfort and confidence? Because I, I think somebody like me, I mean, I am, I'm, quite a bit older than you are. I want to do some of that hiking. I'm probably a little out of shape for that. When I go to take pictures, I, I park my car, get my camera and tripod out, and I don't really walk around too much. Uh, I need to. But what did it take to develop that level of confidence? Like, you know, I could take people out here with me and develop this, ex create an experience for them. How long did that take? If I had to quantify that, I would say it, it took me the better part of a decade, maybe a little bit longer, to be hiking entirely for my own purposes before I, well, I mean, I, I arrived at, at the decision or the, the idea to move into that realm. And I, I think that was a process that probably took something like 12 years of really dedicated mileage and a need to explore. You know, some of that was for great reasons and some of it is was for not so great reasons. You know, everyone's dark and their light is kind of wrapped up pretty tight. Sometimes I was running away from things by by going out into the wilderness. Even still, there's so much to learn. I mean, when I started the company, I really had very limited knowledge of first aid applications and specifically wilderness first aid. 
you know, there is an industry standard for that. It's called the uh, woofer or wilderness first responder, most typically provided by the, the Knowles Outdoor Leadership School. And I made a promise to myself that within a year of starting the company, I would get that certification. And I did. And all of a sudden, you know, my awareness of wilderness travel expanded. You know, and every year that goes by, actually, I'd say my awareness expands because I continue to expose myself to the patterns of the land, uh, the movements of animals, the cycles of wildflowers. So it's definitely an ongoing learning process. But yeah, it took me about 12 years to arrive to the idea of I can take people out and, and show them something very special and specific. Now that the business of Wandering Mojave Hiking Services exists, your clients, uh, as I recall on the Facebook post, and I think this is probably the the tipping point when like, you know something, this would make a great podcast. I needed to reach out to you. You, as I recall, were taking an elderly woman out in rock climbing. And there were, I think there was kind of like you had described, I think in climbing the rocks, it was more vertical than it was horizontal travels, but um, who are your clients and are they young whippersnappers? Are they middle-aged? Are they, you know, 50s, 60s in in my age range? Who who are your ideal clients? Well, who my ideal clients are and who my actual clients are, you know, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily the same. I, I think what you're referring to is a woman named Mindy who I now consider a friend, and, and she's a resident of, of the region. So she lives up here full time. She has a business up here. She's 62 years old. And she's battled with weight issues through a large part of her life. But she is a very persistent individual, and she's looking to test her boundaries so that she can expand them. And that is my ideal client. And it doesn't matter if you're 62 and five foot one like Mindy is, or if you're 28 years old and you know you're an ultra marathon runner it doesn't really matter because what i'm doing is i'm providing a specific context to a specific venue which is the national park and integrating the full spectrum of that experience be it physical or educational or even psychological it is all really part of it but what's wonderful about mindy is that as someone that lives here, she's elected to do several hikes with me. And so we get to develop a relationship together in the landscape, which again, that's my ideal is that I get to develop a whole narrative experience for someone over time. So for me, that's ideal. Most of my clients are women. And whether that's, I say that's women in groups, not necessarily with other women, but with their families or individual women. Uh, women typically set up vacations for their families, and it's it's single women that are out there to really tackle stuff in amazing ways. You know, I never get uh, a 30-year-old tough guy that wants to go out and learn about botany. You know, I get women that want to learn about botany, want to test their bodies and and do things that scare them so they can do more of it and do it better. And I really love that. I get some great families every once in a while. It's wonderful to see fathers and mothers and their children, you know, enjoying the outdoors together. Uh, A lot of times it's a vacation when they've come from different parts of the country to meet up for a special occasion. And then I would say there's a a one other sector of of people I'm out with. and, And these are actually not people that are paying. I do these things called adventure days, and those are for experienced hikers only. You know, the mileage is always going to be somewhere between six and 12 miles. The train is always going to be extremely varied, and it's a collaborative route finding process. And those are really good for me to get out far places, remote places, and places I've had my eye on for a while. So, and all of that eventually gets incorporated to the customized outings I bring people on. Very good. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the range of service that uh, Wandering Mojave provides, and especially these customized outings. So, what are you offering on the website as far as you know experiences for whether it's the minis of the world, the families, or the? By the way, when you said single women, I'm thinking I have to get out there, um, <laughs> even at my age. But in any case, I digress. What are the range of services that you are 
offering uh, for someone that's interested in exploring Mojave and Joshua Tree? Well, my first year in business, I kept it limited to half day hikes and full day hikes. And, and for me, a half day is anything basically less than six hours, which even six hours can be a long day. And not everyone's really up for that. It could be four hours or even three hours, depending on people's needs and abilities. I really maintain a focus and philosophy that time is more important than hours. So I could be out with one person for six hours and do five miles or and out with another person for four hours and do eight miles. So, you know, time is definitely more important than miles. And then when I moved into my second year, I had committed to offering overnights and I started doing that or actually I've started taking appointments for that. I've not had my first one yet looking to have my first in February. And those can range anywhere from one day to four and a half days. And those are going to be really peak experiences for people where I manage all the logistics of caching water and food if that's necessary and connecting very large sections of terrain in the national park to take people through different climate zones and you know biological communities. So that's the thing I'm most excited about. And I'm really eager to, to get some inquiries for that. Great. And when you're out in Joshua Tree, what is the range of, let's just say terrain, the range of uh, life, whether it's animal life, insect life, whether it's plant life? And, and I'm sure a lot of this changes by season and even time of day. Some animals are are nocturnal. Some are, you know, just given the fact it's desert, it's hot, it's probably a you know, fair amount of things going on day and night, but what's the range that people can expect to experience if they were to go out with you? Well, I think the most important thing to mention is that Joshua Tree National Park is actually made up of two very distinct deserts. And the Colorado desert is makes up the eastern portion of Joshua Tree National Park with the Coxcomb Mountains being the farthest eastern boundary. And then the Mojave Desert, which makes up the central and all points western portion of the national park. And, you know, in terms of floristic communities, they're very distinct. There are no Joshua trees in the Colorado Desert, which is technically a a subsection of the Sonoran Desert. Um, And then the Mojave Desert has higher elevation. It's closer to the coast, which means it gets more precipitation than the eastern portions. And so between the eastern portion and the western portion, you know, the animals are going to be completely different. The plants are going to be largely different. The temperatures in the day and night are going to be completely different. Speaking to what people will encounter in terms of wildlife, the desert is not like going on safari in Africa, okay? It's not like being in Yellowstone and being surrounded by bison or elk or something like that. The desert is extremely harsh. And it requires a lot of conservation of energy and protection of resources. So so animals just are not running around like mad. And when they are running, either for food or sex or water, you know, it's a very calculated move. So I can never actually guarantee that anyone will see anything. But that being said, red-tailed hawks are not unusual sightings. Black-tailed jackrabbits are not unusual coyotes, I wouldn't say are unusual, but the chances of someone seeing a bobcat, for instance, or a mountain lion or a bighorn sheep, that's quite a bit slimmer. On two separate occasions, though, I have had the amazing opportunity to do bighorns with clients, which is quite special. And then yesterday, I did a very kind of special thing where I went out specifically to seek a specific species, which is something called a mountain quail, which is now considered a species of interest in Joshua Tree National Park because over the last 50 years, the uh, observations of that species have dropped very dramatically. Uh, And I actually encountered it and documented it. And I just wrapped up a report that I sent to the National Park this morning about the fact that I saw something that very few people see. 
Very good. You know, this actually brings up another question. In addition to your work, you just brought up the national park. So they're, they are the national park, uh, the Bureau of Land Management. They're responsible for the protection upkeep of the park. Are there other avenues to gain insight about what you can see in the park, you know, whether it's flowers or uh, birds, insects, any, are there other? uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. There's some really incredible resources, actually. Hiring a guide is, is one way to do it. And then, but there's great access to other things. And I'll give you a few examples. Um, There's the Joshua Tree National Park Association and they are like the the first point of contact. They're almost like the non-federal citizen arm of the Joshua Tree National Park. And they provide something called the Desert Institute, which has all kinds of amazing educational opportunities that are very subject specific. So you could be learning about geology or botany or birds. And for anyone that wants a kind of extent an academic opportunity to learn about the park and its environs, the Desert Institute is an incredible option. And then there's also another 501c3, which is the Mojave Desert Land Trust. And what they do is purchase private lands and take them over as stewards, either in perpetuity or with the expectation that it will eventually be given back to Joshua Tree National Park. And specifically, their mission is to maintain uh, wildlife corridors, for the species that move in and around Joshua Tree National Park and preserving view view sheds. So both of those groups are amazing ways to either learn or get involved and volunteer. Fantastic. And and I know as I was beginning to go out to uh, the Mojave National Preserve, I know there's volunteer opportunities though i think they're they're still closed down but i would just for me i would just love to get like no like one day a week i'm going to get out there and volunteer and you know i don't want to you know hopefully when covid's over i don't want to be in a, in a gift shop but i'd rather be out and about and exploring the park and and doing some good there i just think what a wonderful experience and the association as well as the institute and the the, the trust i mean just wonderful opportunities I'm curious, as you have been out you know, over the many years, is there one or two sightings of something, a, a relic, a, uh, a an interaction with a wildlife, a flower that you, it's, you know, Travis, it stopped you in your tracks and, and you said, oh, wow. Can you think of some that's kind of jumped out for you? Yes, I absolutely can think of some. Sp- specifics. But I want to note that I continue to do this kind of work because I have those sorts of moments on a regular basis. I don't mean every week or even month, but you know, being in the wilderness absolutely provides the opportunity for presence of mind and body. And so when one is present in mind and body, the world is pretty fresh all the time. Specific moments. I've had moments, this is kind of back when I, I did trail running, uh, when my knees were better than they are now. I came up over a ridge, and it just so happens that it was a very windy day, and the wind was in my favor. And because I was coming up over a ridge, what was on the other side of the ridge had no idea I was there. And when I came over that ridge, I encountered a, a herd of bighorn sheep and was more or less right amongst them. There was about six of them. And we all stopped for a moment, stared at each other, and then the the bighorn scattered. I've had actually a couple instances with bighorn where my proximity to them was, for lack of a better word, nearly beyond belief. I've had moments sitting underneath desert willows, which is Chiloptis linearis, and that grows in the washes of the Mojave in lower elevations for sure. They tend to bloom and what I would say late spring or early summer, their perfume is heady. I got like heady, like you open a bottle of wine and it makes you swoon or like some chocolate or something like that. And with butterflies and tarantula hawks 
and hummingbirds swarming all over the place. And I've just laid underneath and like took all that in. And I had, I've had one legitimate close call with a rattlesnake. Uh, and I was roughly 11 miles from anything. And I stepped right next to it and it rattled. I had no idea it was there. Uh, uh, it is much more likely the case to not see them at all or to see them and be able to move around them. I've done both. I'm probably past thousands over the course of my hikes, but the number that I see are is so insignificant, really. Uh, but after that instance and being by myself, I, I went out and I picked up a satellite messenger at that point, because if I was going to keep doing solo trips like that, I needed to have a little bit more security. Doing that wilderness first responder course is something that helps with that too. Oh, most definitely. I am curious also, if somebody needed to create awareness about the Joshua Tree National Park, Mojave National Preserve, where, where I'm going, and, and by the way, I, I'm going to be hiring your services most definitely, because this is like, I mean, yeah, when I saw it on Facebook, I'm like, yeah, I need to know more about this. And I'm thinking the novice, somebody who's out in the Midwest, the East Coast, they're so used to the big city. They've never been out into the middle of nowhere, but not just any nowhere. What what do you say to them to invite this opportunity to have an experience like which you and the services of Wandering Mojave have to offer? What do you what do you say to them? You know. I need to feel like I would want to think about that. You know, I, I guess, would you, what would I say to them? Is this, is this in, in a sense to convince someone that it's worthwhile experience or? Sure. Well, you know, I don't, we don't want to convince, we don't want to twist anybody's arms. We want to say, sure, yeah. if you ever have a chance to get out of the big city, and essentially take the time to be alone, like you just said earlier, with your thoughts, the quiet, to just be still and to take in these, say, the energy of Joshua Tree and the quiet. Or, you know, for me in Mojave, it's the stars. I, I think I know what it is. Deserts are old places in terms of their their state of climate and their state of geology deserts are exceedingly old landscapes they've gone through several processes prior to arriving in the state of a desert which is i think technically it's if you receive less than 10 inches of year a rain you are a, effectively a desert and every desert prior to arriving at that point was something else Maybe it was a shallow sea. Maybe it was a forest. Maybe it was something else. But a lot of, a lot of serious changes in, in cosmic time and planetary time had to take place before a desert became a desert. So when you go out to a desert, you are surrounded by silence because they're typically remote. They're not uh, inhabited. And... But you're also, while it's silent, it's also simultaneously telling a very long story. So I think that the balance of those two things, the long story that exists in deserts and the silence side by side are what make them very unique. And and for me, like another way to put it is environmental noise. Like if you're in a city and your brain is kind of like a sonar, you're looking around with your senses and everything's bouncing back to you very quickly. And so overload is, is very real. But in a desert, your senses go out far, sometimes hundreds of miles to a horizon. And the time it takes for that thought to come back to you and what the shape of that thought is, it's fairly profound. I mean, there's a reason why religious movements have happened in deserts. It's because they're trippy, wild places. <laughs> and a few wild mushrooms as well. <laughs> oh, wow. This is fantastic. That's good. I mean, I, I think there's definitely much to what you just shared. And uh, I know I appreciate that. And our 
our listeners uh, will as well. I mean, there's so much to offer. I mean, we, you and I could go on and on. I mean, I would love to go on and on because I, I just think the work that you're doing and this passion is just, it's amazing. And, and for me, that's why I feel so fortunate to be here in, in Las Vegas because, it, you know, Mojave, the National Preserve, Joshua Tree, it's really not that far away. And it's not at it's all. It's not. It's not, Howard. And like, I really, I really want to encourage you to, to come out here. Come out here and see me. I'll give you a screaming deal, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I know you will. Uh, but <laughs> let's, let's, let's walk around together. And remember, time is more important than miles. I, I totally get it. And just, you know, just with my, just to be the experience in the moment, you know, and it's, it's funny. I want to go back out to, you know, this weekend and I probably will, I'll take my camera, but I really don't even want to do that. It really, in reality, I want to just go out there and sit in silence, look at the stars and just listen. And there's just something about that. And it's just, it, it's, it really, it's energizing, it's inspiring, and, and really just your work and Wandering Mojave Hiking Service is just such a wonderful way to gift that to people. So it's, it, and, you know, especially in this, the age of COVID, we're still there. What a wonderful way to, you know, for yourself and for your family, just to get out of the city and just, you know, be out in the open space and what, you know, a wonderful person like you and, and an expert to be able to help introduce individuals to that experience so uh, we really appreciate you joining us on today's podcast travis hey howard i really enjoyed talking to you and i, I wasn't kidding about that invite fantastic well I, trust me i am going to take you up on that we're going to talk about that when we're done uh travis if our listeners would like to learn more about you your work with wandering mojave hiking services where are the best places for them to go wandering mojave.com is an easy place to start. That's, you know, that's kind of just the facts sort of place. You can read about my services. You can see a lot of my photographs. I also have a blog that is not as populated as I would like, but you can actually read about my encounter with the rattlesnake uh, if you check out Wandering Words there. I'd say the most engaging place, though, to figure out what Wandering Mojave is about is, you know, through my Facebook and my Instagram pages. You know, that's where the conversations are happening. That's where people are training knowledge about flowers and animals and stuff like that. Fantastic. Well, we will definitely provide the backlinks to Wandering Mojave, to your social sites, uh, and to the blog as well. And, and once again, Travis, I'm so glad I found you on Facebook and you were open to joining us on the podcast. And, you know, it, you know, not only hearing your experience, but I can imagine the experience of, the, of this woman that who, who you recently took out at 62 years old. I mean, what an experience and, and to be able to, to share that adventure. So, and the beautiful thing about what you're doing is you're, you're helping folks create stories. And what better way to do that? And it's such a beautiful place like uh, Joshua Tree. So thank you again. Hey, thanks for recognizing that, Howard. I really appreciate that. All right, folks, we've just been chatting with Travis Puglisi. He is the founder of Wandering Mojave Hiking Services. And Travis, and through the company Wandering Mojave, it, they, on a consistent basis, are working with their customers, clients to explore the Joshua Tree National Park. And, and you know, they do their darndest to create uh, unique experiences, whether it's, you know, an individual uh, just wants to go out for a day hike, or maybe there's more challenges that they want to lean into. And, you know, Travis is right there with them to help support them on that quest. So listen, folks, uh, do go out again to Travis's website at wanderingmojave.com, Facebook, Instagram, and to the blog. And of course, again, we'll provide some backlinks. And, you know, we're even going to chat with uh, Travis after the podcast is over. We'll put some pictures up on our show notes on our main webpage, successinsightpodcast.com. You can also find us on our Facebook page, Success Insight Podcast, as well as LinkedIn and on YouTube and perhaps even on the Facebook and LinkedIn, we'll, we'll drop in a picture as well. You can listen to this podcast on all the major podcast channels, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Pandora. 
And uh, again, we're also on YouTube. So folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. Wear your mask, practice social distancing. If you're in the big city, you have to practice social distancing out in Joshua Tree or Mojave National Preserve, but it's a little different kind of distancing. But hey, take care of yourselves. And we're going to get through this pandemic in 2021. But folks, do check into uh, Wandering Mojave Hiking Services. What a wonderful service. And I, I mean, I again, I love the fact I'm in Las Vegas and I'm going to be taking advantage of just visiting Joshua Tree and more exploring on my own for uh, Mojave. Okay, folks, we'll see you on the next episode of Success Insight Podcast. You take care now. Bye. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.